Okay, so I just wanna say hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Sue Baker Kenton. Sue is a visual artist whose practice includes collaboration and print. She has been a member of Leicester Print Workshop for many years, joining in 2013. Um, she is part of our community of upper floor residents um, who have studios here. And um, she's also part of our tutor team, leading in-house, off-site and online courses. So that's a very brief intro to who Sue is. So um, I'll get started and say, Sue, can you please give us a brief introduction to who you are? <laughs> okay. Um, as Katie said, I've been associated with the workshop for quite a long time. Um, I first um, came to the workshop um, when I was selected for an award um, at Rugby Museum and Art Gallery to make work based on their social history collection. And part of that award included hours at Leicester Print Workshop. And that was when I first started um, working with the workshop. And then in 2013, I was the artist in residence um, and I sort of led a collaborative project with three printmakers and three non-printmakers, um, which, yeah, <laughs> went on for about a year and, uh, and I haven't really left since then. So my practice is um, print, it's based in drawing. I mean, a lot of you know this from knowing me. Uh, it's rooted in drawing and I work with print um, to realise quite a lot of my projects. Um, yeah. Perfect. I think that's really interesting you say that you came to Leicester Print Workshop and kind of didn't leave. That seems to be no. kind of <laughs> quite common throughout a lot of people. That's really lovely. So yeah, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, what I'd like to start by talking about kind of this work is the initial development of your work and how you first conceptualise a project. Kind of like where do your ideas come from? Have you got any artists who um, kind of influence you? Okay, um, well, I don't, there's no particular route um, into where these ideas and, and work, you know, ideas I want to pursue come from. Um, I suppose what they are kind of, they, they evolve as a kind of distillation of different information. So that might be something that I've observed. It could be something I've overheard. Uh, I'm quite nosy, so I listen to other people's conversations on the bus and wherever. Uh, it could be something I've heard as a discussion on the radio. It could be something I've read. It could be a quote. Um, it could be something like a piece of contemporary dance, just trips some switch or some association in my head. You know, it could be reading a bit of critical theory. Um, and what happens is that that kind of marries somewhere in that soup over time, those different bits of information will fit together or start to fit together into something. And that kind of gives me a direction. I don't have a, I don't have a clearly um, formed idea when I start making a series of works or working on a project. I have an idea about two or three things that I'm interested in that I want to investigate. So I'd sort of take it from there and then the work, the process is actually really important and that time working um, is when the idea starts to evolve and really be pulled around. Um, in terms of artists, uh, I look at lots of people um, and obviously like I'm sure everybody does, you have artists that you return to time and time again. They're the kind of touchstones. And then you have other artists that come and go because they might be working around themes that you're interested in or something just chimes at that moment um, in terms of how they're making work and it fits with what, what you're doing. Mm. Um, I suppose the sort of most constant um, in terms of interest for me are filmmakers. Um, I watch a lot of films and I would say that 
they kind of inform quite a lot of my thinking around the themes I'm interested in. Really so, um, I, you know, I'm, <laughs> I've always been drawn to that sort of generation of German movie director, sort of post-war, um, who kind of, you know, really got into their stride in the late 70s. So people like Wim Wenders and Werner Herzog, um, I look at their films and also female directors more. Um, so people like Jane Campion and Andrea Arnold, um, Lynn Ramsey. Um, and they're kind of the sort of common thread. I was, I was thinking about it when I was thinking about these people, the sort of common thread is that kind of watchfulness that their characters have. And these are characters who are processing all manner of things that life's thrown at them. Um, and they're sort of trying to work out their situation, you know, and where they sit within it. Um, and they're often kind of set apart. You know, the women are usually quite strong or very strong. Um, but there's a real kind of almost painful kind of tenderness in how these filmmakers capture um, what the, you know, what these characters are going through, you know, and even if it's something that's quite a violent episode. Um, so that kind of chimes with me in terms of the sort of themes that I often return to in my work. Um, so I'm sort of interested in, in the passage of time and I'm interested in that how that sort of our corporal permeability how our interaction with the world and with other people affects us and what's going on internally how that manifests itself externally so what what the surface of that looks like in terms of the form um, of a human so <laughs> no, it's quite a long answer <laughs> thank you for answering so in depth yeah, I'm sure everyone's really interested in how your ideas come to fruition because you seem so so set in what you want to achieve. So that's really interesting. No, I sort of am. I am and I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we can see by your current exhibition um, that you are kind of, you're really obviously drawn towards etching. That is kind of your love. Um, has that always been the case, or is it, or do you kind of change your technique project specific, or is it, you know, kind of etching is your your bottom line sort of thing? Um, uh, I do return to etching a lot, um, and I suppose I the print processes I tend to work with are etching and lithography, um, and both of them. Um, are processes I use because because of my roots, you know, in drawing. So they're both, you know, allow you to explore, to explore your ideas through drawing, really. Um, I think when I use etching, I use it because it's of its materiality. It's, you know, it has a resistance, it has a physicality. Um, so etching I will use particularly for that. Um, if I'm if I'm sort of making other work that um, might kind of reference sort of communication or protest, then I tend to use lithography because that's its history as a medium. So um, I will match the process to what's going on with the project, you know, what the project's about, conceptually how it fits. But I mean, also there's a kind of practical there's a practical element to it. Um, and with this project, I wanted there to be a sort of physical, almost three-dimensional surface to these prints. I wanted them to exist kind of in the world um, because the projects sort of, I was investing, you know, I, when I started this, I was thinking about ideas of digital imagery and it's kind of ubiquity and how that affects visibility and sort of how we see ourselves and how other people see us. Um, so I wanted, a, I wanted a, 
an analog process that allowed me to create multiples, which referenced and mirrored that. But I also wanted a process that allowed me to create unique individuals pieces, um, which obviously with an etching plate, you can ink them in different ways. And each one, you know, at that size, they're an hour each to print basically. So they're not, and I'm not, I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a printmaker who prints editions of everything the same. Um, I'm not particularly, I can if I'm, if I have to, but I'm not particularly interested in that. Yeah, you really like the kind of the painterly way of inking a plate and things like that. Yeah, it's I'm, I'm just interested in trying to make the piece as right as it can be. And once I've done that, I'm not interested in repeating it. <laughs> Stop at perfection. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know about that, but it's um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, this coming on from that, this exhibition is obviously very extensive. Obviously, you guys um, on Zoom can only see a tiny part of it here behind me. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of when and how it all kind of came together, really, because I think that'd be really interesting. Okay. Um, right, I do have a few images in a minute to share on that, but um, I'll just say that the, the project started in, I think the first plates I made in about February 2016, um, which sounds like a very long time ago, and um, I will also say at this point that I do actually work on more than one project at once. Because I, when I, yes, <laughs> when I had an exhibition in the autumn, I had one of the students say, she said she's been working on these for five years. And I wanted to say, yes, but I've been doing other things as well. You know, I don't just work on one thing. I find it really handy to kind of leapfrog. Um, so if I get stuck, you know, I've got time to, to live with it. Or actually, in the case of this project, if I just get I'm not going to say bored, but maybe that's getting there in terms of having to produce so many pieces of work, um, taking time out and doing other things and then coming back to it actually helps me revitalize what I'm doing with this work. So um, I'll, I'll just sort of pull up this and if I can share my screen, I'll just talk through because this project has lots of different elements and I'll just talk through how some of those um, came into being, because it's obviously, there's a lot of stages to it in terms of when I started working on the plates and where it is now. So can people see that? Yeah. Um, if you've got a drop down menu of everybody's faces, if you minimize your, your screen, you can see the images. Okay. Sorry, no one can answer, can they? I'm assuming that... Um... If anyone has got any um, kind of technical questions or anything like that, please do pop them in the chat if kind of things aren't working out for you. <laughs> okay. So um, these are some of the images. So the, the impetus for this, this these these works when they started, um, I'd been thinking about selfies and I'd been thinking about how um, people curate themselves online. Mm -hmm. um, and how they don't necessarily curate, you know, in brackets themselves when they're out in public because they're always looking at their phones. So they're fairly oblivious to, to to what's going on around them and to sort of engagement and communication. And they're communicating um, just as meaningfully, but in a different way on a digital device. So I was, because my background sort of comes from drawing and I'm very aware of the sort of history of portraiture, I wanted to reference some of that history of self-portraiture with artists and port the portrait form, but also um, explore the idea of selfies. So I, when I started making these, I kind of set myself a, a brief that I was going to work on these large steel plates, which are 625 by 500 millimeters. 
so they're quite large they're you know the size of the top of your fridge or whatever I mean you can see Katie in front of them um, and I would work on those I would only work with hard ground uh, which means any tone had to be achieved through the, the nature of the metal and that I would make them as opposite to surface as I could. So instead of, you know, holding the camera up and looking up, these people are looking down. They don't have smooth filters on them. And I really wanted it to evidence the sort of artist hand. They're the opposite to being sort of touched up. So I wanted the drawn marks to be really evident. Um, and because there were, <laughs> I knew I was going to do a lot of these. I didn't quite know what was going to happen with them in the end, but I knew I wanted to do a lot of them. So I worked them in batches, you know, I would do six at a time and I would set myself a little exercise. So I would say, right, you're going to do six and you're going to look at the sort of mark making that would have been used in traditional etching with an etching needle, or you're going to look at marks that would have been made when a uh, soft ground came into being but you're still using a hard ground so you're going to have to work with sandpaper and fiberglass erasers. Um, these, these are the earlier ones um, which were very kindly photographed for me um, by Patrick Mock um, in France, one of the residences I go to um, and I don't have any photos of the later ones, but as I moved on working on these, I started to think about the kind of marks we make on our phone and the hand movements we make when we're swiping um, and use that as the basis for some of the images. So these and the models are, um, they are my children, they are friends' children their friends' children's flatmates. Um, the other thing I wanted was I wanted everyone to be under 30 right. in this set of images. Um, and then the second part of this project, which were the old, the old images for the older generation, I did start working on these in the residency in France at Maison Louis Jardin. And I was testing um, Andrew Baldwin's hard ground roll on hard ground on an etching plate and I, I was or yes was it hard ground or soft yeah it was hard ground that you can use soft ground so I put some tissue on and started making these drawings and the the experiments with the ground went horribly wrong but I ended up with a series of these little drawings on tissue and that really interested me this idea of fragility of materials mm. um, and I wanted them to be quite small um, and I'd been thinking about sort of invisibility. Um, I'd been making a few etchings that I'd been printing in um, almost transparent ink in just off white ink so they were hardly there and I was, I was thinking about this idea of visibility in portraits. So this work just started completely separately from the other portraits. And um, at that point, I put a proposal into Yasmin Canvan, who was the director at Leicester Print Workshop at the time. Um, and I proposed that um, I would show these two bodies of work together. Um, and I was also beginning to be interested in this idea of taking print into three dimensions. So I'd been making little photo etching plates of the monotypes and then casting them in plaster. Um, and I was thinking about those lovely little Edward, uh, Elizabethan miniatures. I'd just been to an exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery. Um, so I took that as the idea for the moulds. I mean, none of these were ever finished. These, these were sort of initial tests that I showed Yasmin when I um, proposed the exhibition. So the exhibition was booked in for February last year <laughs> and um, COVID happened. But in the meantime, after the proposal, um, I was working on, I'd worked on a couple of other 
projects. And when I look back at it, I can see where some of the ideas for this, this install were beginning to appear. So one of them was that I had some work up at West Yorkshire Print Workshop last autumn. And um, I'd been due to show in the gallery at the workshop and then about, I don't know, about three weeks before the show, they said, oh, someone's dropped out of our new space in Huddersfield. Do you want that? And the, um, the, the good news is it's a really big space. It's four times as big as the gallery at the workshop. The bad news is it's a week earlier. The exhibition starts a week earlier than we said. So I said, yes, as you do. And then thought, what on earth am I going to put on the walls? Because I had some work, but... Um, so I pulled out these series of prints, which were made originally um, to be filmed for a short animation. And they've never been shown in their entirety. I'd only ever shown one or two pieces. And I started to think about how I could group them so that they have a very sort of particular relationship to each other. Um, and if I couldn't animate them and have them working against each other in a film, then maybe I could hang in a way that got the work to um, reverberate. Um, I'd also been making a series of tiny little, well, not tiny, but small zinc etchings um, of members of the family. Um, I probably induced by lockdown and everybody, you know, being in the house together on top of each other. Um, so I had these, these images and I had these little etchings that I was talking about, which were thinking about invisibility. And I guess as the kind of, you know, thinking about what had been going on in the world, how some people had been on top of each other, you know, in, uh, grouped together, cooped up for months, and other people had been isolated. Um, I hung these in this, in this way in the exhibition to start to get a feeling of that different relationship between um, the subjects of these images. So that was kind of me thinking about um, how you hang work so it starts to have a conversation across the space and in the space and set up new readings of work. Oh, um, sorry? Yeah, I said, yeah, that's really lovely. You can really kind of, the way you've hung that show, you can really kind of start to see this one kind of coming out of it. So that's really lovely. Yeah, I think it, it was really important, actually. And I was so lucky because Martin at West Yorkshire, they were just fantastic. They just gave me the space and pretty much like Lester have done and said, do what you like. I mean, it's such a, as an artist, that is such a privilege to be able to do that. I bet it was um, a little bit of extra stress, though, when it's <laughs> kind of four times the size and then you've got to do it. It was, but, you know, it was good. It was good. Yeah. Um, and then the other, the other project that I think fed into this was, um, it was a project I did for um, the reform exhibition at Leicester, which was the members exhibition. And um, I basically created a suite of lithographs, which all, well, they were all composed with um, one layer that was a kind of backdrop I wanted them to be like theatrical sets. So we had a backdrop and then we had different characters that inhabited these backdrops. So I have my sort of gridded stairs, I have my wooden backdrop and I had different elements that turned up. And the idea was when the, when the work was hung, I only hung four of these and then members of the public were invited to recreate, you recurate them um, at the cultural quarter late events and to set up a different story. So they would create new relationships and set up a different story with the prince. So these are some of the uh, images of one of those evenings. Beautifully taken by Katie, I think. They're your photos, Katie. Um, 
And it was a really interesting exercise because a couple of people said to me, if you just put all 20 up on the wall, I would have thought, oh, they're very nice, but I wouldn't have looked at them nearly as hard as I've looked at them having to do this. And that was quite a revelation to me. And I think that was the, the other catalyst in terms of me wanting to hang this work in a way that the audience had to participate to actually get from the show what was going on. Yeah. Um, now. Um, shall I just talk a little bit about the install or shall we? Um... I'll go on to my um, next question, which includes some bits about the install. So um, shall uh... I shall I stop sharing and then yeah. we can come back to that. Yeah, perfect. So um, it's great kind of that you would kind of go in that way anyway, because um, my next question is about the hanging of this great exhibition. So as a workshop, we were really excited by your uh, proposed plans because it was really taking us out of our comfort zone even having you know like this gray colored wall here that is something that we've not really done before so um yeah it was really great to kind of push us that little bit and especially kind of using the kind of 3d hanging system as well um what challenged you and what excited you about hanging this way um I was really well obviously I was really excited at the opportunity to do what I liked that that was great to sort of just be given a space and to be told that you know you can you, you can do what you like I mean how lovely um so that was really exciting um the challenge is I think you know not to harp on about lockdown but it it was you know it created lots of challenges um in terms of logistics in terms of not being able to get into a studio to print etchings um and not uh not being able to just access all the normal stuff that you can you know um so you know you realize when you print that you do need lots of stuff you know and having a, a photocopier to hand and you know that prints acetates and all this sort of thing is really handy so lockdown was quite you know it threw me all my normal routines for where i do different jobs you know didn't happen um so i think that was that was the sort of first real challenge um and I was, you know, initially we were going to, or I was going to wallpaper part of the gallery. And I needed to get a hold of wallpaper that could be silk screened, that didn't need a background colour painting on it. And I could only find someone in Edinburgh who printed wallpaper where I could get that paper from. And then I had to get someone to decide if we were going to test it. And then would she be able to get enough in time? You know, there were lots of things like that that in normal times, you, you just wouldn't have been a problem because she wasn't buying stock in because she wasn't having any, you know, getting any work. Um, so there was lots of stuff like that. But then um, obviously the, the workshop were great. I went in and printed on Sundays there, which was really good because that gave me a chance to um, be in the space and think about the space and what I wanted to do with it. Um, but I think I think working with unknown materials was quite a challenge. Um, I would tested sticking prints onto MDF in West Yorkshire, but I hadn't done it on the scale that I was imagining doing it, you know, at Leicester um, and yeah even things just like getting all the board cut in times of Covid is not simple. Um, the chap who fabricated the stands lives in Hastings so there was a there was a sort of trip to London and a, an exchange of you know all this wood. Um, so yeah that was kind of a little bit of a challenge. But what was exciting was um, because this is kind of part of um, a year's research um, on an Arts Council Develop Your Creative Practice Award, um, I've had the opportunity to, 
to collaborate and work with other people. So um, I work with Rebecca Partridge, who's a curator who came in to work um, when we started to think about what was going on in the gallery. Um, and Keith Allett, who's the filmmaker, who's making a little documentary about the project. Um, it's been really interesting working with him. And, um, and then I collaborated with my daughter on the soundscape for the, for the exhibition. And that was interesting, just working in a different, um, a different form. You know, you, you realize when, when, because we're used to sort of, I'm used to working with sort of visual images. I'm used to that sort of um, thinking about associations. Well, you know, certain forms have associations, certain subjects. But of course, sound works exactly the same way. So that was kind of mainly a process of elimination. You know, oh, it sounds too much like Doctor Who or the radiophonic workshop. You know, we can't have that. Um, or they, you know, yeah. So, yeah, there's been lots of challenges, but lots of um, very interesting aspects as well. Uh, I do recommend that everyone comes and sees the exhibition and with the sound piece. Um, mm -hmm. Because yeah, it just takes you to whole of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> it really does, yeah. <laughs> Makes you think. <laughs> so kind of you've kind of answered this in a way, um, but having lived through the hanging of this exhibition and kind of reflected on your experience and everything, um, what would you have done differently, if anything? Um. I think I definitely would have, having had more time, I would have tested everything more. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, there was quite a, yeah, it was, every, nothing happened and then suddenly everything was happening. So it's very stop start as it is for everybody. Um, so I think I would have liked more testing time to kind of refine some of those, how some of those kind of conceptual links were being made. Um, between the different elements in the project. Um, so I think that would have would have been useful, but you know, that can still happen. And I think I definitely, as I talked to Katie about, I definitely would have tried to come up with a different hanging system because the way the work's put up at the moment is it will all actually be destroyed when it's taken off the wall because we can't get the boards off the wall without destroying the prints and um, when we installed the show we'd booked in to stay at the Holiday Inn for the you know a couple of days for the week we were up installing the show and lo and behold behind the check-in desk was this fantastic <laughs> theatre perspex signage and if only I'd been there a couple of months before it would have uh, informed me Typical. Usually. <laughs> you, can, you can put that in place for next time. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what is next for this particular project? I know, I'm sure it feels like you've kind of come to a bit of a end of an era, really, work, working on such a large body of work. We're really interested to know kind of, yeah, what is next and what is next for this project and what is next for you as Sue? Um. Oh, well, Katie, you'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> I might do some more silk screening on windows. Katie's the wizard window screen printer. Um, well, I think because this is part of a kind of, you know, a testing, it's a testing ground really for this year. It's a kind of catalyst to kick it off. So, um, and because I'm going to have to destroy the work anyway when I take it off the walls, um, it occurred to me, and also because as Katie said, what would you do differently? Um, I think rather than just waiting and trying to pick those things up in a new project, I'm actually going to begin working on the prints on the wall because they've, they've been worked, all the different elements have been worked really separately and now they're all installed as a kind of whole. And I think it would be quite interesting to carry on working on them and see what connections can be drawn out now they exist there like that. So I'm going to start working on some of the etchings um, on Mondays when the gallery is closed. No one could see what I'm doing. 
and I might or I might not tell people what I'm doing. <laughs> And um, I'm also going to um, be in the gallery for a week at the end of the show as a drawing residency. And I'm actually just going to probably just draw all over the prints and the wall because it's a great opportunity to have a big wall that's not flat and to see what happens when you start putting drawings on it. So um, I think. I think that's, that's, that's the practical extensions. Um, and then there's a series of events going on with the exhibition. Um, we've got a couple of call outs for self portraits with members. There's going to be a questionnaire call out. So this is kind of research to feed into where I'm going with some of this next. And um, I've just started speaking to a couple of people to organize some talks. Um, uh, one of the ladies is going to give a talk on um, self portraits and women which I think is very interesting because all of this kind of um, underlying theme of identity and what happens, you know, what happens when digital uh, gets involved. I think that sort of history of identity and women and self-portraits is, um, is an interesting one to be um, mining. And we might try and organise some sort of discussion, discussion events and hopefully a sort of closing closing event in the gallery if we can ever have people lots of people in there but yes all we can do is hope <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah well thank you so much sue uh, i'm sure i can speak for everyone uh, we feel like we've received a real insight into you how you plan create deliver inspire everyone around you um, so thank you very much. So um, what I'd like to do now is open up um, the chat. So if anybody's got any questions, please feel free to turn your um, camera and your audio back on if you would like. Um, and then or you can just pop any questions you've got in the chat and we can ask them through to Sue. Or you could just ask me. Everybody's looking. We're all waiting. We're waiting for somebody to speak. Yeah. Who wants to go first? I don't want any difficult ones. <laughs> I won't ask a question, but I will say how um, stunning the show looked. I just thought it was fantastic. It was really um, atmospheric and really um, full. Yeah, I thought it was a really, really strong exhibition. I felt incredibly, um, yeah, I felt incredibly moved by it. And I really loved the subtlety of the images on the wall as well. I thought they were really beautiful. Oh yeah, I haven't talked about those, have I? We haven't talked about the other images. No. no. Bit of a myth. Very anyway, I should thank Claire and all the women in, of Alligate for their support. Because you know the pictures when they were just starting as etchings all those years ago. Yeah, a long germination, but, mm. but really fruitful. Mm. Yeah, that it's born such a you know productive and strong exhibition. Thank you, Paula. I was thinking, should I have shown those images of the wall? I've got them. Would you like to quickly show them now? Uh, has anyone got any more questions? Shall I just share those now quickly? <laughs> Sorry, that was a bit. Now I've hidden the meeting. Okay. Right, sorry, these were the other ones I was going to share, wasn't that? Okay, so um, in terms of, we talked about the etchings, but the other elements of the work, um, which related in part, in part to the concept, but also actually they're really site specific because the light at, Leicester at the workshop is really wonderful um, and it was something that we thought we could use to kind of animate the space and echo this idea of images on screens so wonderful Katie 
um, gave me a crash course in printing on windows, silk screening on windows, although Katie did all the printing. So really Katie just gets the whole credit for this. Um, so we printed some of the uh, portraits on the windows. Um, this is just a shot of an overall shot of the um, space because I wanted to show how much is devoted to the etchings and all of this is devoted to the images of the older generation, um, which are silk screened directly on the walls. Um, and this is a this is the best photo we've got so far. <laughs> which can people actually see faces on on it? No, no, no. Okay. I can a little bit, but only because I know what they look like. <laughs> yes, I can. Okay, good. Um, so they're printed, these, these little portraits from those monotypes are printed in almost transparent ink um, in clusters. We decided uh, when the wallpaper got abandoned, it was because I, I felt that if it was wallpaper, it was going to have quite a regular pattern. And that could be mistaken for sort of social isolation because it would be very regular. So the I sort of took the decision that they, they would be printed in little groups, almost like constellations of stars. And what happens is as the light changes in the gallery, you know, they either read as dark or they read as shiny. Um, but like I say, very difficult to document. We might just see this light with the laptop. So I'll take it round in a second so you can have a look to see whether you can see them. So yeah, sorry for um, missing that bit. Um, Serena, have you got a question? Yeah, I was going to ask Sue, um, really, um, about labour, actually. Can you hear me? About, can you hear me? I can hear you. You said about what? I didn't hear the about. Yeah, sorry, I've got my mic stuck together with dental floss because it fell apart. Um, yeah, just, re you know, I've watched you for so many years labouring and working physically with you know and I guess the work is so hard won physically I kind of you know wonder if you've you've had any had any reflection on that you know in terms of yeah I, it's just yeah it's, you know kind of <laughs> yeah yeah but I think it is it, you know it kind of gives it a meaning that um is probably invisible to people who walk into the gallery but I can't look at the work and not know about that labor um which is is kind of hidden there to as I say to the sort of um unknowledgeable well, but yeah I just yeah it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts about that that it element of hidden. it. It is hidden, but then it's the absolute, you know, conceptually, it's the absolute opposite to a digital image that's taken in five seconds. So conceptually, that works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, then, and sort of inverting it so that the, you know, that thing that the, it's really important for etching to have a have a physical presence, whereas the older generation are kind of embedded in the wall. You know, they have a they have a longevity, but a kind of fragility as well. So I, th you know, so I think there's a yeah. I'm alright okay. with the labour. You're okay with the labour. <laughs> I might you can't draw for a while now though. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> you don't envisage um. A different kind of um, way of working that might make things less physically arduous. Um, no, I, I I enjoy working mm. with those materials, and I think the time the time it takes is really important in terms of mm. how work develops. I think it's it's become quite embedded in my routines of how I work. But as I say, I it was very particular to this project that they were that size and that labor intensive mm. and that might not be the case with the next project mm. i might just be silk screening on windows <laughs> yeah no i'm just quite interested you know i'm sort of interested in this this thing about um 
that la laborious um, attention. So, yeah, yeah, just interested to hear but what that, you were... But I mean, if I was painting, painting mm. you could do one a year. Yeah. Yeah. Paintings, uh, paintings labour intensive. So, I don't. Um, you know, and I think as with anything, if you add up the hours, some of them just, it's like a drawing, some of them just go right first time. Mm -hmm. And others you work on for weeks and weeks and you never manage to pull it out, really. Even if you do, you never quite like them because you know. <laughs> so, I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, I don't see it, you know, I don't see it as a kind of negative thing. I just, yeah, kind of interested in that, um, that's, that's Petra, in the, um, the mindset that, that is a necessary part of that, um, that labour. And, uh, yeah. Well, maybe yeah. That, well, that, maybe that's where I go back to Werner Herzog. You know, maybe there's yeah. a link there, yeah. deeper link than I thought. Yeah, Fitzcarraldo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, can I ask you about invested time um, with with etching in the relationship between the scratching time and the inking and printing time? Um, I would say the drawing's probably quick. I think the processing is the length with it. So I tend to draw quite quickly when I'm working on them. Um, and I'm not, I'm not particularly interested in them being technically excellent. I'm not a printmaker where it all has to be beautiful and tidy. I don't mind if though that sort of history of the process shows in the image. So if I've put the ground on slightly too thick in certain places and it doesn't bite properly, I'm not bothered. As long as it doesn't disrupt what I'm after in the drawing, it doesn't bother me. So I'm, I've got a lot of bad habits. It's like driving a car. I've got a lot of bad habits when I'm working on the plates, shortcuts, things I do. Um, because I'm, I'm not particularly interested in spending lots of time getting everything you know all the grounds perfectly level and <laughs> all the edges but you know I'm not interested in that I'm interested in what that material gives me and how it makes me draw and how it answers back and how it kind of provokes me to make marks and and do you keep working on um, a plate and uh, putting more grounds on or working on the ground and then take a proof and then do some more work on it? Um, I'll do quite a lot, then take a proof. Then I usually get some sandpaper or burnisher and hack a load off of the plate, then put another ground on and do some more drawing. I do quite a lot of taking off as well. <laughs> Good. You know, and I suppose in a way that's why I quite, I quite like... Um, working with steel because it it's cheap and it's it's very movable um, you don't have to be precious um, it's got a lovely grain to it so you can use sandpaper and polish it up so it's a bit like charcoal in terms of how you can move it around and it's a it's obviously a very different way of working as to how you might work on the lyso where you just would be setting up a nightmare for yourself if you were just going to keep drawing things and taking them off again. Whereas with etching, you can do it. So are most of these steel plates? Uh, the, the ones in this show are, but I work on other metals as well. It depends what the project is, what the images are. But for this, because I knew I needed at least 24 of these things and I wanted them that size, you know, I can buy a piece of steel for sort of 12 pounds, you know, and not worry about it. And, um, and when you're printing, do you, I mean, I've seen people spend a lot of time putting ink on and then spend an awful lot more time taking the ink off before they print. Do you, I mean, do you, do you uh, ink, and, ink and wipe and ink and wipe or what? Give us a, it, give I us, get a, give us a I get a production, like, like I, I work them in batches, so I'll have, you know, I'll have sort of six plates here, I hard ground them all, I draw them all, I then bite them all in the same sitting, you know, then I'll clean them off, then I'll proof them all, and it's a production line. You know, they're all out on the bench, and they're all inked and wiped and then printed. Um, and most of them are 
just inked and wiped as they are. I don't really do much fancy monotype wiping on them. I try and do it with the drawing. Um, some of them, you know, if I lose the will with them, then I might cheat it a bit at the end. But yeah. Thank you. Um, Soraya? Hi, Sue. So echo what Claire said. It's a fantastic exhibition. Um, but I had a, a question about the title. Um, whether, um, can just sort of kind of where the title came from, whether it, how it evolved, and whether you intend a title to be a means of getting in, of, of the audience getting in, or all, almost a means for them to either have to think or to have to take, you know, a liability to take certain interpretations of that title. Um, the title c comes from a term that's used um, about how the brain processes information. That's, that's where it's from. Um, and it's to do with how we relate to the world around us, you know, these sort of things we send out into the world and what we do with them when they come back. So that's its kind of origin. And it could be, it could be taken on that level and it would be great if people did think about that. But then it also could be taken as a kind of statement of intent for what's coming next. You know, this is a kind of forward broadcast for where the work's going to go. Um, I, I don't, nothing, nothing, nothing in the soundscape or the, or the sort of title or anything is there by accident. So therefore it's, it's designed to, to, to get people to think about those connections. But, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, it's just an observation from my point of view. It's not a kind of, um, it's not, uh, it doesn't have a particular message. You know, I'm not trying to sort of preach anything. It's just an observation. So if people um, want to sort of read into it, fine. But if not, then they can, you know, everyone can engage at whatever level they want to in terms of the complexity. Does that, does that yeah. answer it or not really? No, it does, it does answer it. I mean, because I think I'd sort of partly interpreted about the way um, the use of the mobile phones and that sort of, they're projecting mm -hmm. themselves forward in a different way because they're looking down when normally when you're project, you know, mm -hmm. in transit, you, you're looking up. Yeah. So I, I'd sort of taken a, what, possibly quite a sort of literal um no I, th I think that's that's fair. you know it can be multi-layered can't it <laughs> you know ideally it is so that's what we're all aiming for isn't it that it's got um, multiple readings um there is i think we have talked about that a bit um we've done an in conversation for impact magazine which will be out in the autumn and um i think that's addressed in that I've got to try and remember where all the bits are. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Soraya. Have you got any more questions? I think that might be it for questions. So, uh, thank you very much, Sue. What I'm going to do here is end the recording.